Hi, I'm Mark Stelter, Director of Community Association Lending here at Itasca Bank and Trust Company. Even after 20 years, I wake up every day with the same goal, to make maintaining properties as stress-free as possible for property managers and board members of any size association. So whether you're a manager, board member, unit owner, vendor, or just someone curious about life inside a community association, join me as I sit down with guests from the field. Welcome to Community Association Insights. Let's get into it. Welcome back. This is our second podcast for Itasca Bank and Trust Company. And uh, we have two amazing guests with us today. Uh, I have Carrie Surratt and Simon Fox from Associa Chicagoland. I want to welcome you to our podcast. Thank you. How was the drive? Thank you. Okay. Not bad. Not bad. So I appreciate it. It was a little bit of a drive for, for Carrie and, and for oh, Simon. This coming. is uh, an easier drive for me because I live in Naperville. So oh, okay. That's it's, a, it's a straight shot up. Usually my commute, because I'm in the city every day, is an hour and 20 minutes. So oh, this was no problem. A half an hour to get here today was refreshing. I appreciate you guys coming in. Thanks for so having us. The, the purpose of our podcast, as we've mentioned in the past, is this is meant to be an educational tool for unit owners, board members, um, uh, property managers, uh, business partners uh, in the industry. We did our first podcast with Cheryl Murphy, uh, executive director of CAI. Uh, if you haven't seen our first podcast, I would encourage you to go back and look at that. Cheryl was an amazing guest. Um, CAI Illinois just provides uh, an incredible amount of resources. Uh, website is CAI-Illinois, all spelled out, dot org. Uh, you can reach uh, Cheryl uh, at their offices or you can communicate uh, through their website. I would encourage you, especially if you are a board member or a unit owner in a self-managed association, um, look at CAI. It's uh, it's an organization you'll never regret joining. They, they're terrific. And in fact, I think you're a board member. I am. So congratulations on that. Thank you. So hopefully someday we'll see you at the president's position, maybe. Mm. So I'll be voting for you regardless. So Thank I know that, that takes a lot of time. I know. Uh, so let's start out with a little bit uh, just about each of you individually. If we could kind of talk uh, with you first, Carrie, just give us okay. a little background as far as, you know, how you arrived at this point in your career and maybe a little background as much as you want to share. Sure. Um, so I started working in management in 1999, um, worked as an assistant, 12 years was at the same suburban management company and left as the vice president, went to a small company. They were building themselves up and helped them grow and then they decided to sell. So at that point, I made the decision to start my own management company and I think I successfully did that for about five years. Um, grew pretty pretty decent for a suburban management company and then sold. Yeah, you had a, you had a lot of growth quickly. Very quick growth. Um, mm. I had some great support staff. Um, myself and one other manager handed, handled about 60 clients, and um, I loved it. Um, and my my right-hand woman left to move to Arizona, and at that point, it was just the decision was easy to sell out. So um, left to go to the company that bought my company, worked there for about five years, and then um, Associa kind of called to me and I made the the transition over there and um, a little over a year after being there I got the regional director title so I work in their Indiana area um, and manage some Illinois clients but um, we're mainly trying to grow our Indiana area for where I'm at and um, I'm on the CAI board I'm the new secretary which is exciting I guess and yeah, it's um, a great board you know. it is I I I like being part of CAI. Um, we've I've been on the committee for the conference and exposition since 2011, chaired that, and then stepped back to make the decision to run for the board. And it took me a couple tries, and then uh, got elected in 2021. 20, okay. And so I've been active and staying active. And these videos really aren't meant to be time sensitive, so to speak. Um, 
you know, they hopefully will, you know, span uh, a period of time, maybe even years or so. But the, the trade show, for our purposes today, just happened uh, last weekend. Yeah. It was a phenomenal show. It was um, amazing. And so I, I say that uh, for any board members or, or unit owners or uh, business partners, uh, anybody that might do work with uh, a community association of any kind, townhomes, condominiums, cooperatives, uh, look up CAI, uh, the website, as I mentioned, uh, CAI-Illinois.org. Um, take advantage of the events, join CAI, become a part of the organization, and when you get to the trade show, which is typically in February, in that late uh, late January, yeah. February time frame, um, buy a booth, get involved. Uh, it's the best money you'll ever spend. Uh, you meet managers, you meet board members. Um, you know, you and I have known each other 20 years. I was thinking yeah, about it. You know, I know. I've, I've basically watched you grow up in property <laughs> management uh, and, and you know, um, probably old enough to be your parents. So I could just say I'm so proud of what you've accomplished. You have such Thank a you. unique experience. You started out working for a couple of firms and then took that risk. And I'm always jealous of entrepreneurs because they have a, a mindset that uh, the rest of us just don't have. They're willing to take risks. They're willing to put the work in. You probably had a lot of sleepless nights. You know, you're making payroll, all that stuff. So you, you leave working for somebody very safe. Paycheck's coming on Friday. You go out on your own. <laughs> you you start your own company. <laughs> you develop a lot of properties quickly. Um, you're, you know, I just, I, I you know, We've made uh, loans to properties that you've managed over the years, and every time I've been in front of a board, you can just tell how much the board looks to you for direction and guidance and how much they appreciate all your efforts. Um, and then you take all that experience, and then you go to a larger firm, like Associa, mm -hmm. and you bring all that knowledge in, and now you're mentoring and you're leading and you're doing this. It's like you, you couldn't write a story any better than that. So uh, just very proud of, of your accomplishments. Thank you. um, and then we have Simon Fox, who brings his own unique story, uh, as you'll uh, find out, uh, or you've already heard, uh, Simon is from the UK and a yes. formal naval officer and been in property management in the 13 to 15 year range um, yeah. and spend a lot of your time in the city. Yeah, so um, I was a naval officer from age 19 to about 25. I uh, went to Britannia Royal Naval College and Walsh Maritime Academy and um, eventually bought a ship from Plymouth in the UK to Fort Lauderdale and met my wife, Cecilia. And so uh, we met, we had about three months apart. I had time left on the deployment, but we kept in touch. And so uh, it became pretty clear to us eventually we had a choice. She could move to the UK or I could move to the States. And I just didn't feel that it was fair for me to continue in that career and be away for long periods of time. And the uh, idea of moving to sunny South Florida was quite appealing. <laughs> Not the worst thing in the world? No. So uh, we, we eventually moved up to Chicago. Um, I really moved, sorry, I really missed having Four Seasons. Um, what got me into con condominium association management, though, was a dinner with one of her law school friends. Her husband at the time managed a high rise in Aventura in Florida. And uh, he was curious about how you manage a ship. And then I had no idea this concept of managing a high rise building and what that might entail. But we would talk about heating, ventilation, air conditioning. We'd talk about the fire suppression systems. And it became apparent to me really quickly as I'm preparing to move to the States that there is a career there potentially that is rewarding and lucrative that I might be able to utilize some of those skills. And so um, I'm glad that I had the foresight to realize what I didn't know. And so I sort of reset my career and said, I'm going to start, put some time in as an admin assistant. I really want to learn the basics uh, before I start to run. So we're down in South Florida for about a year, and we decide we want to move to Chicago. My wife's sister lived here and um, got a job working uh, for one of the, uh, at the time, big four property management companies, I would say and spent five years on site at a property in the West Loop with 266 units. 
And this was at a time when the West really is nothing like it is now. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm talking before. It's gone through su such a transition. Right. I mean, when I started there, there's no Target. There's no Mariano's. <laughs> right. So, you know, the Nobu Hotel hadn't even been thought about. So okay. that five-year period, I really sort of oversaw the building through that transition. You saw the type of residence they changed. Um, the feel and the vibe of the West Loop, you know, it, it just really took off. And uh, it was something for a while where I felt the West Loop, it was perhaps underappreciated, but as it gained prominence, my management at that community too gained recognition and prominence. And so eventually, you know, I was assigned high rises and Lake Shore East, 300 units, um, you would need, I would guess now, at least one and a half million dollars to buy a unit in that building. And uh, there was also a loft conversion building on Michigan Avenue. So all of that gave me the provenance that leads me to where I am now. And it was really just a happen chance. The human resource officer for Associate Chicago Land called me up one day. We're looking for a regional director in the city. We've seen what you've been doing. We think that you will be a good fit for our city office, and we're excited to have this conversation with you. Um, Stephanie Skelly, the branch president at the time, recently got a promotion, uh, really sold me on her vision and the family feel of the company. Uh, yes, Associa has that national reach. We manage more units than anybody else, but I honestly feel when I go to work every day that I'm a part of a family. And, and I think it comes from the fact that it is a still a family-owned company. We're not answering to shareholders. So that has been something that has been refreshing in the last 15 months. And it is something that I enjoyed when I worked at that building in the West Loop. That too was a family-owned company. And that's I think that's um, something that is really special about the industry we work in. Uh, and, and, you know, again, with CAI kind of being the, the centerpiece of that, um, I always say the managers are the centerpiece of all the, the work that goes on with all the vendors uh, because we don't get to the board members and the unit owners until we pretty much speak to the managers first. And in CAI, you know, kind of is that same, uh, fills that same role with a lot of the vendors in the industry. Uh, if you're a part of CAI, and, and again, I've said this last time, there's other organizations that are out there, but CAI CAI to me is is just um, unmatched by any other organization. Um, so it makes sense because we've all probably seen people in the industry that uh, the next time you see them, they got a different badge on, uh, yeah. working for a different company, yeah. and and that's okay. I mean, people you know they go through their careers and they hone their skill and they get opportunities. And you know, I've even seen just with my competitors, I've seen bankers become managers and I've seen managers become bankers. Yeah. Uh, so it you know it certainly does have uh, that kind of uh, an impact on our on our career so and I do want to talk a little bit more about Associa uh, once we get a little bit further down down the road because it is uh, an incredible company and I want to kind of let people know uh, a little bit more about it what I want to try and educate the the viewer and listener on is you know what are the benefits to professional management we get a lot of calls when we're doing our lending um, to community associations. We get calls from uh, board members that are professionally managed, and we get calls from managers that are managing those properties, but we also get calls from a lot of as uh, associations, community associations that are just self-managed, and they could be any size. They could be, you know, we lend all the way down to six units um, and above, but, you know, we get the calls from the 30 and the 50 and the 100 unit associations that are self-managed. So you want to so, take that one? Yeah, I, I think the overarching umbrella, and then the, there are a, a series of topics underneath that, is that when you engage a professional managing agent, we'll do the heavy lifting for you. And that can take many forms. So let's talk about banking. You know, I had in Lakeshore East a building that purchased from the developer an empty commercial space. They didn't want a restaurant in there. They recognized that there were new buildings going up, better amenities. They wanted to convert it into co-working spaces, a party room. They wanted kitchens. They wanted theater rooms. So, 
it, w it was a lot of work, right? right? You know, I not just having a conversation with one banker, I'm having conversations with fives. You know, we're having lunches, we're having business meetings, we're comparing. I have to get three vendors to scope out the build out. I then have to take that to all the bankers so that you can get to a point where you're comfortable right. that you know where we're putting this sure. money. So, you know, in that particular building, we're talking um, relatively successful people with busy lives. I, I think we can all relate to that. You know, they're working in a fast paced environment and they developed a sense of trust that we would be there for them to do the hard work to piece together the information, make the analyses, make a recommendation, but also give them space to have their input. We do all of this, I think, while we, we still recognize that this is their home and we're a partner in this. So um, I, I often will joke, I actually don't, at least when I was uh, an on-site manager, I didn't used to get to make a lot of decisions but it's about having those conversations, getting the information, putting in the legwork, pulling it all together, presenting it to the board with my recommendation, um, taking a lot of the hassle out of that. From my perspective, it's more of an education. The managers license their designations. We're doing continuing educations. The homeowners are volunteers. If they're not active, they're not knowing what laws are changing, what the proper protocol for something is, how to follow the governing documents correctly. And if you hire a professional management company, you're gaining all of that knowledge and they can steer you in the right direction so you're not ending up in a potential lawsuit for saying or doing the wrong thing. Those never happen, right? Uh, <laughs> I've never been part of them. <laughs> but we have like standard operating procedures. And so just something simple as filing taxes and making sure yeah. that the right level of financial oversight is provided, you know, whether it's like compiled or whether you need to have an audit. We have these systems in place, right? So, you know, you could have a portfolio manager, it's got eight buildings, um, but we have systems that make sure that everybody stays on track. I think if you're self-managed, you may not know what you don't know, and we are there to bridge that gap and to keep everybody on the right track in terms of compliance. Yeah, and that, um, that's an important point because the idea of you might not know what you don't know speaks directly to, you know, let's say, uh, the Illinois Condominium Property Act, the, the governing documents, uh, declaration and the bylaws. Because those are so easy to read. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you ever... If you ever uh, you know, not able to sleep at night, just open up the <laughs> Illinois Condominium Property Act and uh, you'll have a fun read. Well, one, um, one real that. life example of that, actually this year, I had two communities who weren't really sure where their maintenance responsibilities began and ended. Mm -hmm. um, but you benefit from our professional experience where I was able to go to the board and say, you need to talk to your attorney, have them put together a maintenance matrix that more clearly delineates the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So now at these two communities, the homeowners have a sheet of paper where, okay, I, I have a plumbing issue and it's here. That's clearly my responsibility. They don't need to go back to the decoration to try and make that determination. Right. But you know, if you don't have the experience, if you don't have colleagues in an office to sort of sound off on right. and have those organic conversations, you, you would miss that. You would just be stuck trying to interpret this, and uh, it would take a lot more time, I would I would say. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned filing a tax return. I, I can't tell you how many times we've uh, come across an association self-managed, and you know we have a checklist that we need for lending that we give them. Mm -hmm. um, just simple financial statement information, and one of those items is a tax return. And uh, regularly, we get well. We don't file a tax return, and then you know it's it's kind of moving on from there. It's like wait, wait, wait. Let's back up a little bit. You're not filing a tax return. Um, you know, there's there's issues related to that, and even with the financial statements, uh, I believe the Condo Act uh, kind of changes over in terms of once you hit 100 units with the uh, the level of financial statements right. that you have to... Right. You have to follow certain uh, practices and protocols uh, through, I think it's GAP. Um, right. Yeah, the GAP accounting. So um, it, does, it does make a difference, but there are still some 
hundred and plus units that are still self-managed yep. and not following that. So yeah. and gap accounting, you know, just uh, to break that out, generally accepted accounting principles. Mm -hmm. So there's just Correct. a different format, a different way of recognizing revenue expenses, things along those lines that the CPAs uh, can certainly guide uh, guide them with. Um, maintaining good standing. You know, in the uh, state of Illinois, if you're a corporation and associations generally are not-for-profit corporations, mm -hmm. you have to maintain a good standing. You have to be able to understand how to file that annual report, recognize who the officers are. Um, I had put down, uh, uh, you know, compliance with the, the Condo Act, um, filing the tax return, staying in good standing, and then understanding your own governing documents, which, uh, you know, we kind of talked about as well. I think one thing that we do a lot of is uh, moderate and organize the board meetings. Um, you know, Robert's rules of order and, you know, making sure that the meetings are properly noticed, that the agendas are posted, that the minutes are approved and that the resolutions are properly recorded, that the motions are made, there's a second on the table, then you can have your discussion mm -hmm. and just moving it along so that they can have more productive meetings. And how many lawsuits and, and uh, legislation, uh, pieces of legislation have come out of just something as simple as that? Uh, the Palm case, and you know, it just you know, it changed everything for managers. It, it, it changed the entire industry, and and it came out of kind of that that uh, type of a situation. Um, so yeah, that understanding that um, uh, understanding defining terms. What's a limited common element? What's a common element? Who's responsible? Right. Can you kind of alluded to that, Simon? As far as am I responsible for paying that? Um, is the association responsible? And we're going to actually our uh, our next podcast is going to have uh, a couple of uh, attorneys that are going to kind of help us define those terms a little bit more. So we'll kind of uh, we'll go into that as well. Yeah. They'll, they'll be grateful to the attorneys that we steer away from that. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always say that at the board meetings. Um, I don't know what your attorney's going to say, but I think they're going to say this, and I always <laughs> end it with "call your attorney" because they're they're going to be the ones. And then assessment collection, correct? I mean that. Yeah. Uh, when you and I first met, assessment collection was you write a check, you have a paper coupon, you mail it to a PO box, and then somebody at the other end rips open the envelope and you know processes that. And just that process has taken on a completely different uh, uh, look to it. Um, and uh, Associa, I'm sure, works with a very um, uh, technology-forward uh, institution to, to do the collections. Absolutely. Not only that, I mean, the ability to pay e-check, reoccurring e-check, credit card payments through those third-party applications that most management companies can offer make a huge difference in, difference in getting those money collected now before collection action starts. So, All right, um, and it helps with the delin delinquency report. Who's paying? Who's not paying? Right. And then what uh, actions do we need to be taking for people that that aren't paying? Or what you know, what options can we give them? Maybe for a payment plan, and, and you know, kind of get that, uh, get those assessments because uh, that's the lifeblood of the association. One of the things that I love with Associa is the IT. So what we have is a platform called Town Square. And so you can have an application on your phone, which you know I think about when I got into this industry was almost un, un sort of thought of at the time. Uh, but you can put in walk order requests, you can see what your account balance is, you can make payments mm -hmm. from your pocket. Uh, there's just so many um, useful ways to to make those payments and and to keep yourself appraised. The um the other item that I had written down was vendor relationships. Uh, so when a board member is sitting with, uh, or when the, the property manager, uh, manager is sitting with the board members, um, we have made um, many loans for associations that have simply had or chosen the, the wrong vendor, the wrong contractor, let's say. Um, they've come back, it, it's two years since the work was done, and we're having the same issue. Roof repairs, you know, siding, there's uh, water that's uh, getting involved. Um, a manager who is experienced, such as the two of you, 
you've worked with vendors, you've worked with the contractors, you've worked with yeah. uh, you know everybody in the industry. You can sit down at a board meeting, and when you're looking at those three uh, bids that you have to get, you're able to give the board your experience and say, look, I've worked with this firm or this company. This is a top-rated company. They've done really good by us in the past. That uh, happened to me uh, this month. Um, there's a master community in the Pilsen area that, that I work with, and uh, they had engaged a um, landscape consultant. You know, they're, they're looking to um, improve, and there was a list of vendors that the landscape consultant had prepared. And in advance of me reading the report, I had three or four vendors of my own that I had sort of penciled in. And the report that they had and my recommendations were the same. And for that board, the sense of comfortability then just increased. You know, you have somebody who's been in the city for 13 years doing this. He understands that these are the right providers for us. But independently, they've engaged this landscape consultant professional. And so it really gets people to a point where they're comfortable with the decisions that are, that are being made. And, and to further define our terms, because you had kind of mentioned, you know, the Master Association and, and in a lot of community associations, uh, there will be uh, perhaps uh, well, multiple different individual, let's say, condominium associations and even perhaps mixed with a condominium and a townhome association. And there are uh, situations where you can't really delineate between where one association's land, the physical property, stops and another one begins. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a master association might take, uh, uh, let's say, a, a suburban townhome association where there's six different associations, but they share a clubhouse or they mm -hmm. share the pool. Um, or, you know, downtown where you might have a, a condominium building surrounded by some townhomes. And again, they're sharing some of those elements that the, the amenities uh, and the master yeah. association doesn't necessarily um, uh, manage one particular building. They manage everything outside of those buildings that right. uh, the amenities that they would take uh, yeah. advantage of. Would that be a fair yeah. uh, that, that is fair, yeah. Okay. Um, and so... There's diff there's definitely differences between management management firms, right? Uh, and and as much as I'd like to say Associa could handle every association out there, I think it's a fair statement to say that there are just some associations, especially uh, smaller self-managed associations, because I get these calls, and uh, they might want your former firm that you had, right? You probably had a tremendous com competitive advantage where it's like, look, here's my cell phone, I'm the owner, call me. And, and you probably pulled a, a fair amount of business over just based on on that. Whereas uh, a larger firm, associate and some of the competitors, you provide uh, an incredible amount of technology, and you probably have, I would think, a sweet spot in terms of what you're looking for in terms of a, a city or a suburban uh, property management. But what are some of the the differences uh, that you've seen over the years between management firms? I think a lot of it's technology. Um, what what they can offer their clients. Um, there are some that are still working out of their home um, with their employees yeah. in their basement mm -hmm. and barely use email. And, and then you go to the Associa where everybody's on email. You have the Town Square platform. They can make requests and message the managers directly on that. Um, I think that affords you know a lot more access to the managers, which is a double-edged sword sometimes. Um, but we're there, you know, to help out when we can. And I, I, and I think there's that probably there philosophical are, differences too, right? Yeah, I mean, there are companies out there that are directly answerable to shareholders. All right. And the culture exists and, and it's recognized that they have shareholders to answer to. Um, but then at a source, as a family managed and owned company, there's a, a difference in, in the philosophical approach. And, uh, you know, I think at Associa, when we talk about the work family and creating the work family, it's something that, like, everybody in the office, I, I truly believe, believes in. And, and I think that comes from the, the top down and, like, what are the objectives? And that, I think that's one of the things I, I've come to appreciate about Associa is it is family owned. Uh, at Tasca Bank, um, we're independently owned. Uh, and so when we look at our competitors, uh, you know, what, what we uh, talk about is the fact that, look, all the decisions uh, when you're working with Itasca Bank, they get made in Itasca. 
Yeah, so some of the differences between the management firms out there are the products that they offer. So typically, management services fall into three broad categories. You may have financial only. So if you have six units, 12 units, the amount of involvement that you would need from the manager is obviously less than so. And, it, and it's priced according to that, correct? It is, right? yeah. You, yeah. You will pay a much lower management fee. And so it might just be that you need help paying the invoices, collecting the assessments, and then once a quarter, get in a financial statement that says, this is your cash position. The next step up from that is portfolio management. So, you know, it could be six units. Um, I have some in my portfolio, 17 to 20. And, you know, you stop by the property once a week. They may have staff on site. Um, they'll have projects. They just need a little bit more help. They don't need you to be there every day. Um, but generally, they, they need some guidance, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they need to know how to navigate mortgages, as I think about a, a co-op that I manage. Um, and then the next step up from that would be like for, more sort of full service on-site management. And I talked about some of the buildings I've managed before, and that's what that is. And that's you know. fully involved. They're, yeah, you're probably you've, in contact with board members on a maybe daily or every other day type basis. Yeah, when I think about, you know, as in Lake Shore East, there's two of us in the office, <laughs> there's probably 800 residents. I've got an engineer, an assistant, we had four janitors, five doormen, and, and it's very involved. So there are companies out there that will specialize, some of them, in just one of those three particular avenues, but at Associate Chicago Land, we'll provide all three. Um, there are a few companies in the city of Chicago that will do that, um, but we're one of them. Yeah. And, and one other thing that we're kind of going into, I just took over a property at the end of last year where we're actually consulting. So we're not doing their financials. Um, it's a developer-owned community, and we're trying to help them grow their um, their policies, procedures, review their documents, and um, that's a new one that I've kind of jumped into, and we're just using our experience to help them build their community in the best way possible. Yeah, and, and that's really, um, the, the nice part about it is you, you're offering a menu of options, and, and they get to pick from that. And... Uh, Really, the fact that Associa is family-owned um, really does, and, and the size that it is, really does kind of put it in, in somewhat of a, a more unique position. Uh, you know, I task a bank. Uh, we're privately owned. Uh, we have shareholders. Um, we're not part of a larger um, uh, publicly traded uh, organization or corporation. Um, and I think the similarities between the two companies is decisions get made locally. Decisions get made quickly. I couldn't agree with that anymore. Like and we have a large shared service center that does what I consider a lot of the heavy lifting in Texas. Uh, but there is autonomy and decision making that I get to do in in the city office. Would would you agree? I would absolutely. Yeah, that is to me that does stand out um, because we are in a world where it's you know you have it seemingly you have to grow uh, in order to survive, and um, I'm fortunate enough to work um, at a bank where. Uh, you know, growth is important, certainly, because it is, uh, you know, with any company. But the most important thing is what's going on with the customer. How are we making the customer uh, happy? How are we taking care of their needs? Uh, what do we need uh, in order to do better with that? And every single day when I walk in, that's the, the, that's the theme that's going throughout our organization. And it sounds like it's the, the same that's going through. through yeah, years. I think it's uh, employees. You take care of your employees. They'll take care of the clients, and from there we have good building bots, and everything else will take, will take off accordingly. Yeah. So if and the reason you know the two of you um, are um, so um, well positioned uh, on the show today is Simon. You you tend to be more in the city, and Carrie, you tend to be more in in the suburbs. Do you see differences or challenges that face a manager? Uh, with a city property versus a, a suburban property? We were talking before this. I, there, there are things within a city building that we were talking about that mm -hmm. uh, plumbing, <laughs> they, they can't replace a cast iron pipe without a union and without 
replacing with a cast iron and I just had one done and we've replaced <laughs> with PVC and I'm going, wow, you yeah. know, what a difference. And I, I think Chicago itself rules on its own. Right. So right. what we I, might follow in the suburbs is completely different in the city. I think uh, Chicago, if I was to generalize, has a tendency to exercise its home role. Um, I might be mistaken, but I think that, that there's a role that a municipality over 25,000 can exercise home role on certain things. Um, but the city, as it, as it looks at firefighting, for example, um, given the unique structures that we have in the city, may well be inclined to exercise that more. And, and we kind of covered this when Cheryl was here, uh, as far as the, the challenges. I mean, Chicago, uh, obviously, just uh, the history that it has, you have 100-year-old-plus buildings that have been mm -hmm. converted into now residential units. And, uh, you know, the I think the facade rule, I think it's 80 feet. Um, if a building's over 80 feet, the, the facade has to be inspected. Just We've gone through that, the, the, the porch collapse on Wrightwood, the facade yeah. falling off the buildings. Um, you know, these are all things, and I think if, if any of the, the leaders or politicians from Chicago were here, they'd say, look, we have problems that are unique to a large city, and they need to put into place protective measures um, to try and, and keep the unit owners safe. Uh, you know, so it's just the nature of the. I think a lot of it's the age of the buildings. They're, I think the city has done old. a good job of putting in like those proactive measures, and uh, there's been a real big focus lately on energy benchmarking and making properties you know more fuel efficient. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there'll be more changes to come with that. You know, there's, there's talk at Town Hall about EV charging legislation. That, that'll be the next big thing that I think a lot of us will be uh, discussing. The sub suburbs don't have any of that. I, I, I find now managing in Indiana, that's a whole new ball game out there. Um, the laws that are in place in Illinois, right. the collection laws alone yep. are beyond what Indiana has. And I thought at first Illinois was kind of strict on them, and now I'm thankful for those because they allow you to take action against a homeowner. Exactly, yeah. I, I had a, uh, a manager that was telling me, you know, don't worry about the 100-year-old buildings. Uh, those are pretty, those were built like tanks. They were built really well, and, and they reference, I'm not going to say it, but they referenced the time frame when they thought that the, the materials that are used and whatnot, you know, may have changed and, and the, the quality wasn't quite there. Uh, but yeah. it's those inspections the city and the suburbs take to make sure that the, the buildings are um, sound so that we don't have uh, issues uh, that other cities have faced. Yeah, I think we have things in the city that the suburbs don't, such as like union presence. I mean, there are unions obviously in the suburbs, but um, you know, a lot of the high rises, if I have uh, engineers, janitors, and doormen, um, the properties that I've been at, more often than not, those, those will be unionized. And uh, you, know, you might have plumbing repair work to be done. You know, and you talked, when we discussed that earlier, uh, you know, it might be PVC, but for us it'll be copper. Sure. And, um, you know, it's a particular skill set that, you know, the local plumbing union is very good at. And the confidence that you know it's done correctly. That, you know, I think that that's also a plus. These, yeah, and it's typically very big, well-established firms. Um, you know that the job's going to be done right, right correctly the first time around. So uh, let, let, let's talk a little bit about the frustrations of uh, a property manager. Um, do, do we have enough time? I was going to say that. Like. <laughs> we'll go. Right. So the, the two I wanted to kind of uh, focus on, one is um, it's such a unique uh, profession to be licensed. Um, continuing ed uh, credits that go on uh, throughout the year, uh, to certifications, all that you know, and your boss is a volunteer who may or may not even want to be on the board. It's just mm -hmm. that nobody else wanted wanted to run. Um, can you maybe speak to that a little bit? That that has to be something, uh, waters that are a little more challenging to navigate. I, go ahead. I, I always go into it recognizing that this is their home. Most likely the single biggest investment that they've made and everybody is given the benefit of the doubt that you are volunteering your time and you have the best interests at heart. 
so I think as a, as a regional, as a manager, wherever you are in your community association career, if you can go into these um, conversations with that in mind, it's going to hold you in good stead. And just being open to that will help you resolve the differences. We have our professional manager hat on, and because of that, we have a tendency to make certain recommendations, and we have, um, you know, an idea as to always this is the way that it should be, and so we have to be open to listen and to understand. Not everything is black and white, you know. We could have a hallway painting project, yeah. and you could pick five different colors. Everybody's got an opinion on it. I've done a few hallway remodeling projects. You know, they run to sort of like half a million dollars, and uh, we just got to take a step back, make sure that everybody's voice is heard, um, but just gently shepherd and guide the conversation. Communication, it sounds like, right? Yep. Communication and, and a little bit of psychology maybe going in there because you're right. I mean, that makes perfect sense. It's the it's sometimes their biggest investment. They're very concerned about um, the level of my assessment, what I'm paying every month, the condition of the property. Because really, in, in reality, if you live in a suburban townhome or a, a condom, condominium building in the city or, or somewhere in between, you're really in competition for surrounding properties, right? Because if I'm a, a homeowner and I'm looking to buy into Absolutely. a particular neighborhood, neighborhood, I'm looking at several properties. And the, the properties that are well run, have strong reserves, have good strong management, that's going to be the most attractive. So, you know, the second frustration that comes to my mind, because you did talk about the fact that it is their biggest investment in many cases, uh, it's their home, uh, you know, they're, they're concerned about the values, they're concerned about the condition of the property. But um, Getting somebody, a unit owner, to maybe run for the board could probably be challenging. I hear over and over from managers, um, you know, we're having an election and I don't know if I'm going to have enough unit owners to run for the board. What's the conversation you would have with a unit owner where they might want to be uh, looking to run for the board or you might want them to run for the board? So I come from the on-site city background, right? So everything on site is about building those personal relationships. So all throughout my career in the city, at the back of my mind, I've been thinking to myself, you know, where could this person fit on this board? Who is on the board? Who's looking to get off? And where are those professionals that can help plug in some of the gaps? and about having those conversations frequently and early. You can't wait until you're getting ready to put out the call for candidates. You have to have those conversations well in advance. And there is often a hesitancy to want to jump in. They're jumping sure. into the unknown, they're busy, maybe they've got families, professional careers, everything. And it's really just like, what I can do as a manager to help ease the burden for you. Um, as a treasurer, there are things that as a professional management company we will do that will make your role as the treasurer easier. Right. We will help you it's meet your- really. Yeah, we will help you to meet your obligations sure. much better than if you were just on your own. Right. E even as the treasurer, uh, sorry, the, the secretary, right? They're responsible for making the minutes. Um, but there have been times where I have said to a new secretary, I'm going to show you, like sit next to me in the meeting, right. I'm going to show you how I take my notes. Right. I will then draft this. I want you to draft it as well, and then we'll compare it. So it's just about conversation, relationship building, education, and allowing those fears. Like We're here to support you, not to make this more difficult. I realize that there's only so much that you can give. I'll take everything that you want to give, um, but I'm not here to burden you. Right. Yeah, the fear of the unknown. And, and once you get the person comfortable with the role that they're they're filling, you know, now it, it really does become that partnership between the, the board member and the uh, and absolutely the, uh, the, the manager. Um, I wanted to, to give some uh, time here at the end to Associa, and, and they have what makes Associa a little bit uh, unique. You have this charitable arm. 
to the management firm, which uh, I've, uh, I've I've witnessed this in the past uh, at, at various uh, company functions where you've invited vendors in, and there's um, I just find it unique. Um, it's called Associate Cares, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I, I was doing a little bit of um, uh, research uh, on that. And on the website for Associate Cares, it says it's a charitable affiliate of Associa. It is a 5013C uh, with the goal of providing financial assistance for people who lose their residence due to natural or man-made disasters. And the thing that struck me the most is, as I was going through the Associate Cares uh, portion of the website, you don't have to be managed by Associa yeah. to benefit from Associate Cares. And, and to me, again, that just shows the the management firm departing from the we could just monetize everything you know we could just how do we make a dollar how do we you know uh, improve our bottom line um, that says we care about not just our unit owners but we care about community associations so if you're listening or watching uh, the podcast today uh, we're going to put a link to Associate Cares on the on the podcast uh, you can learn more about it. Uh, if you decide you want to donate, that's a 5013C, you can donate. Um, but, you know, I guess the most important uh, item for me is to just learn more about the fact that this is a management firm that goes beyond just managing. Uh, the Associate Cares uh, part of uh, Associate just tells me that you care really about the unit owner, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be somebody that, uh, that Associate is, uh, is managing. Um, anything that I've missed today that you might want to uh, cover or, you know, can we uh, educate our unit owners or viewers in any way that uh, you might want to bring? I found this to be a rather rewarding career over the years. I, I've really enjoyed the sense of helping homeowners um, improve the value of their homes, uh, protect their money and provide them with the lifestyles that, that they envisage. And um, we often joke as managers that it's a career perhaps that we fall into accidentally. Um, so maybe you're listening to this podcast, maybe you are a community volunteer, maybe you live in one of our managed communities or, or that of a competitor. But I would say to, to give this an honest look, it has been very rewarding, and I look forward to doing this for, you know, many homeowners, many community associations for many years to come. So how do they find you? What's uh, the best way for a uh, board member or a unit owner to contact Associa and uh, maybe talk to you about managing their property? So they can reach out via our website, AssociaChicagoLand.com. A-S-S-O-C-I-A, Associa. Yes. Chicagoland, all one word? Yes. Dot com, okay. Yep. Um, or our main office and. You'll find it on the website. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> I don't dial it very often. There's a phone number. Um, and, uh, and so they could reach out uh, for new business. They'll be directed in that to Erica Horndash, yep. um, who, who does that for us. Um, and, or even for HR, um, they can go directly to our website, and all of the career opportunities are listed as well. I love Erica. I love Erica. She's she's great. She's, she's a uh, so great annoying. mentor, great leader. She's been around. We've known each other for a long time as well. And I believe right on your uh, website there is a request for a proposal. So mm-hmm. if they want to go on the website and just uh, hit that request for a proposal, they can get that. So Absolutely. thank you so much for being here. We uh, appreciate it. And uh, thank you for having us yeah, today. Absolutely. This was, a, this was a great learning experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.